No, no, we're, we're alright, Professor. So, this is the Gnosis part of uh, my channel. Uh, this is uh, Professor John Baez, UC Riverside, uh, Physics and Mathematics. And, yeah, let's just go talk. Okay, sure. <laughs> Ask away, fire away. <laughs> Why does it seem like theoretical physics has been seemingly stuck in a rut for the last 20 years or so? Uh, that's a great question. Uh... We're having trouble getting experiments that give us shocking, surprising results that we actually know something to do with. It's, very, it's a very tough question. I mean, no one really knows why we're stuck. Because why, you know, how can, if you knew exactly why you're stuck, you wouldn't be stuck. I mean, well, because it seems like, you know, Einstein like, did that in about like 10 years, and you know, there was experimental variation within four with the whole, the moon. Uh, and that that light curved around the sun. Yeah, around the sun. Yes, it's and then you guys, it's you guys. It seems like it's like twenty five years. Was he just a singular genius? And well, obviously, he was a genius. He was lucky in some kind of ways because we have this great theory of electromagnetism called Maxwell's equations, and this great theory of of uh, particles called Newtonian physics, and they were in contradiction with each other. They couldn't actually fit together. And for some reason, people before him didn't really fully get it. They tried to like jam them together to get them to work. But he just sort of, one of the things, so he could have figured out his stuff without really doing any experiments. And he did. The experiments were just a confirmation. So first he realized, hey, we've got to change our concept of, of Newtonian physics so that it gets along with, with what light does. Namely, that light travels at the same speed no matter what frame of reference you're in. And then, after he did that, which was special relativity, he said, well, we've got to get a theory of gravity that's consistent with that. The old Newtonian theory of gravity is not going to work. That, this is the hard part. This is what took a much longer decade or, or so, is to figure out general relativity to get gravity into the, into the game. But, but the point is that there were these theories that were already working but didn't fit together, and he could just sit there and think about them and Think until he could get them to fit together. Uh, right now, things are the big things that don't fit together are quantum mechanics and gravity. So the reason why I got into quantum gravity is I was thinking, well, maybe I, I could do what Einstein did and just uh, think about how <laughs> quantum mechanics and gravity <laughs> That's should, funny. should fit together and then figure it out. Um, but I didn't feel like I succeeded all that. Maybe it's fine. Progress. That's fine. No, because uh, <laughs> we, we think of science as it's like we go through like a thought evol evolutionary cul-de-sac. Like oh, it's almost uh, similar to that. But that's what we need to do in order to find the, the answers, right? Yeah. So I think we're blundering around. We'll eventually blunder our way out. What would the LHC finding of the Higgs boson being between 125 to 127, 127 GeV mean for the standard model? It means the standard model is doing fine, it's right, it seems to be working fine. So then the big question is, so now what do we do? <laughs> yes, so that, that ties into my next question, which in the third one question would be, how would that finding apply to um, loop quantum gravity? Alas, both string theory and loop quantum gravity have very little to say about elementary particle physics at the energy scales that we can study now. And so, the real, this is one of these reasons we're stuck. We've got all these smart people thinking about loop quantum gravity and string theory. But they're like off studying things, energy levels that are so high that the poor experimentalists can't get anywhere near uh, doing anything for them. <laughs> then when the experimentalists find something, they tell these, these theorists, and the theorists go, you know, mm -hmm, okay, that's good, yeah, but it doesn't help me. <laughs> so that ties into my next question, which is, if supersymmetry was somehow confirmed by the LHC in the next few years, what would that mean for string theory and loop quantum gravity? Okay, that would be, a, that would be a big deal, because string theory is like this huge tower of ideas that's built on certain principles, one of which is supersymmetry, and there's not a shred of evidence for supersymmetry right now. So any shred of evidence for supersymmetry would basically make the string theorists feel like they weren't on the wrong track and it would revive them. Right now they're, I think they're beginning to sort of go, well, maybe we wasted a whole bunch of time. They don't, <laughs> they don't say it publicly, but I, 
they must be thinking. Th those are the things that they, they don't want you to know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, they don't want that's how I felt like. Yeah, that, that, that's how I felt like too, Professor. Don't worry. Um, so the fifth question is: Can you provide a short preview of the topics that will be discussed in quote category theoretic foundations of mathematics workshop unquote May fourth and fifth this year? So this is your plug, Professor. Okay. Well, all I know <laughs> is what I'm going to talk about, I guess, because I don't really know exactly what other people are going to do, but. So the old foundations of mathematics from the early 1900s were all based on sets, and the idea is everything is a set. And math has really grown beyond that point. Uh, and so that's sort of like an old-fashioned way of thinking about things, but the people who work on foundations, meaning like the very basics, they're, they've been a little bit slow in catching up, uh, except for some. And, and now they're really realizing that there's many more different kinds of mathematical structures besides sets that you could take as fundamental, equally fundamental to sets. And, and category theory is a general theory of different kinds of mathematical structures. And so uh, it's, sort of like, it's sort of like going from some old, uh, old operating, old bad operating system. So it's like computer. DOS 2.0. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and saying like, oh, maybe, you know, we still, we could still keep using that if we had to, but why don't we try to try something a little bit more modern here? Okay. A more flexible. That, that will tie into the question that I have two questions from now, but let me go outside of script. Okay. okay. So it's like, what made you decide to actually work in real numbers? Because a lot of mathematicians today, because of the mathematics of the 20th century or so, they're not dealing with, with numbers anymore, like real numbers. Like, that's kind of rare in ma the mathematics field. What uh, what made you decide to do that? When you say real numbers, you mean things like my favorite numbers or that kind of stuff, or just real numbers? Real numbers. Well, I think actually lots of mathematics still is about numbers, even if they may not want to admit it. No, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a huge amount of, of it is just about numbers. It's about other things too, but numbers are great, and uh, mathematicians always are messing around with numbers. I'm not anything special in that way. <laughs> Being the progenitor of the concept of the blog in the early 90s, even before it was called a blog, <laughs> what insights can you share about where media, social information, and sharing will lead to in the next 10 to 20 years? Wow, okay, well... So, um, so I know that's a heavy load of questions. So yeah, you, that's good. H.G. Wells kind of... You should have warned me like a few days ago so I'd come up with some really great idea about what's going to happen. Maybe next time, Professor, if you're willing to do this again. Um, so I... These days, I'm doing a little less blogging and a little bit more of writing very short articles about all sorts of kinds of math and, and physics. Uh, and I feel there's not enough, not enough people doing that yet. So there's, by now, there are lots of math and physics and science bloggers, and that's really great. And in fact, it's so great that that's where you should get your science news from more than from the the newspapers or the TV because because these bloggers are actual scientists and they really know what they're talking about but uh, I think there's room for for more uh, interactivity in different kinds of ways short things like uh, videos of people talking and things like that basically sort of to get rid of the middleman the journalist who doesn't know anything about science. Unfortunately, maybe you're one of those middlemen, but, I like, but you're better than average. <laughs> you're the middleman who, who talks to a scientist, then like writes his own story, screws everything up, and then shows the readers that, right? Let, let the people who know what's going on no, get that, at it. My job is just to ask questions. Yeah, so you're, yeah, so, so, right, so you're letting me have my, my word. <laughs> no, I'm not like that at I all. I just realized that when you interview Sometimes I get interviewed and I start criticizing journalists and then I remember them talking to a journalist. No, 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 no. Believe me, if I was going to write an article, I'd have to be like peer-reviewed by, by scientists. I just, I'm not worthy. <laughs> Which brings us to question number seven. In simple, maybe it ties back to um, question five about the workshop, but in question seven, in simple terms, what new scalable mathematics is needed to replace the traditional partial differential equations approach to differential games? In other words, what is the math world doing right now to make game theory that scales? Wow, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> enough about game theory. I'm teaching a course on game theory to undergraduates, and I'm just like 
a few weeks ahead of the undergraduates. Well, I know, I know a bit more ahead than that, but I, I'm not, I'm not enough of knowledgeable about game theory to know about the cutting edges. I'm just teaching this undergraduate course about the basics right now, and I'm having tons of fun doing it because I can play. I, I play games with the students in class where they're all playing against me, and their grade is partially based on, <laughs> on how well they're doing in these games. No, no that's fun. It's I, I, w I wish when I had my econ econometrics class, like when we were doing Nash Equilibria, that I had a That's <laughs> you what we're doing, yeah. So I'm, we're playing games. I'm, saying, I'm, a, I'm an econ major, by the way. So. Yeah. So we're, doing, we're just doing Nash Equilibria, and, uh, and, and they sometimes screw up when they're playing these games because they think, like, oh, I could get such a big payoff if I pick that. But then, of course, I don't. They forget that my that I'm trying to be good for me, and so that they're not going to get what they want. Yes. <laughs> just yes. because they want it. Yeah. So, so I'm still on this basic stuff, but I'm having lots of fun. Yeah, that reminds me of the econ days from seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so uh, please talk and share your work in Singapore in the Azimuth blog. Uh, S Singapore and the Azimuth blog. Yeah. Singapore. So. Okay, so in Singapore, I was hired to work at this place called the Center for Quantum Technologies where they do stuff like uh, try to work out the technology for quantum computers so like doing things with graphene, doing things with quantum entanglement and so on but I was so I was thinking about quantum mechanics there but I was really starting to get excited about environmental issues and I started putting more and more energy into this thing called the Azimuth Project where I'm trying to round up a bunch of scientists, engineers, computer programmers, and so on, who to try to do stuff that'll help save the planet, because I think global warming is going to be a serious disaster, and we're, it's like a train wreck that I can see that we're, we're heading towards. And Cl global climate change. Global tr climate change, yeah, global, human-caused global warming. And so I figured that if we get some more scientists interested in doing something about it now that by the time 20 years comes around uh, when it's a really very visible disaster we'll have a bigger body of people around ready to start jumping in and doing the things things that we should already be doing now but but the governments aren't uh, quite up to speed yet on, on how urgent it is. What were, what were the projects, this is outside of the, our transcripts, like, what were the projects that you're working on in addressing this in Singapore? Well, team? I'm struggling to figure out what's the best thing to do. And so, so far, the best thing I've been able to figure out how to do is, is basically education. So I'm busy learning about all sorts of things these days, like uh, different... Uh, forms of energy, wind energy, solar energy, and so on. Learning about the, the Earth's climate and so on. Uh, none of these were things that I was an expert on when I started out. So I have a huge amount of catching up to do, but I love explaining things. So I figured the way that I could be helpful right away is as I'm learning about all this stuff to write about it and talk about it. And so I'm uh, and we're developing some interactive climate models that people can run on their web browsers so that people can, like students, for example, can start learning about this stuff. So basically right now, I'm still on a feel like I'm just sort of gear, getting up to speed in this new second career of mine. But my idea is to drag along a bunch of other people with me. By whenever I learn something, I just tell everyone else about it and get them to, <laughs> get them to do the same and hope it sort of speeds so, so is that what the Tor TV, uh, uh, the, the Glasgow lectures was about? <laughs> Because you have you have a couple of videos out. Yeah, know, well, those videos years. were about those are the old me. So those were fun videos about my favorite numbers and so on. But uh, now I'm gonna like this. Now I'm giving talks about more uh, serious subjects like global warming and stuff like that. So so the Godfather of the blog is uh, switch gears. That's so right. It's... Yeah, I'm still in the middle of switching gears. Yeah, sometimes the clutch is going. <laughs> so it's it's almost like you're. Uh, um, it's like a, a mountain pass. <laughs> You're drifting. Yes. It's a drift racer. <laughs> it's scary. Yeah, it's scary. It's very exciting. I urge everyone who's about 50 years old to try changing their, their career. If they, have, if, if they have the opportunity to do it without like going broke or something like that. Because it's really exciting and reinvigorating. 
Uh, it's also nerve wracking. It's very, it makes you make, I worry a lot more than, than I did five years ago because I'm trying to do new kinds of things. I'm not sure I'm, how well I'm succeeding, but it's much more exciting really than just doing the same old stuff. Um, what would you, your advice be for the primary education system, primarily like high school and how to better prepare themselves for the college that we, the math that we use in college? Well, I think the math we use in college needs to be changed quite a bit from what it actually is. So just preparing people for what's in college, I, I could talk about that, but I wish I could change the whole system a little bit. So, <laughs> but what people need to, I, what I wish people would learn in high school is a lot more about uh, statistics and probability theory especially of the sort that you need to be able to um, to uh, understand news stories. So for example, whenever I read a news story where they say that like some new scientific study has shown blah de, blah de, blah de, blah, they list some statistics and the newspaper stories, they always screw up the statistics. They always say like, this study proves that this causes that. But if you look at what the study actually does, it doesn't prove, it couldn't prove that because it says it's talking about something else and something else. So analysis of data and not analyzing cause and effect and understanding statistics, sample, well, sampling and things like that, how, uh, that's the most practical aspect of math. Unfortunately, though, it's not really being taught much in high schools. I mean, yes, everyone should know how to add, multiply, divide. It's good to know. Trigonometry, although how much you use it in everyday life is pretty little for most people. It's good to know calculus, but how much you use it is pretty little. But but uh, understanding enough statistics so that you can you can tell if, uh, if 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 it's really true that eating this is gonna decrease your your lifespan or something like that. You know that that's very practical actually, and that that's what I wish people would teach better. Okay, so you hear that, people? <laughs> econometrics. <laughs> yeah, I exactly, say econometrics. That's yeah, statistics, econometrics. Yeah, even a little game theory. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Oh, so this is the silly portion of our um, of our interview. Okay. Um, lastly, so favorite. just I'm gonna have rapid fire, right? This is eight, so one of your favorite numbers, right? Okay. Uh, Kirk or Picard? Picard, definitely. Okay, Braveheart or Spartacus? Uh, brave heart, but I don't. Know. Five or eight. Eight is definitely better in the long run. <laughs> okay, Star Trek or Star Wars. Star Trek, definitely. Okay, PC or Mac. I have a PC, even though a Mac is cool. But but um, Ubuntu or Windows Eight. I'm using Windows, but Ubuntu is cooler. I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> Day person or night person. I'm sort of a night person. Okay, would you be willing to do this again in the future? This, for here, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. <laughs> right. Thank you, Professor Bias. So okay. I promise to do it better next time. <laughs> All right.